Two, sovereignty and law. In Islamic Africa, in a political conflict, one Yoruba chief wrote a letter of protest to the district officer in the era before 1950, stating, You appointed me king of Babo, but Umaru is still king in the quarter. There can be no two kings in one kingdom. The writer Gambo understood the nature of civil government far more clearly than most churchmen. It cannot be two kings, two kinds of law, nor two lordships or sovereignties in one realm. To assume that a humanistic state can tolerate an alien law and sovereignty in its midst is insanity. No state ever has except the dying ones. Normally, there can be no two law systems in one realm without conflict. Since World War II, in particular, the humanistic establishment of the United States has been in a steady, if not covert, war against biblical faith and law. It has steadily overturned long-standing landmarks of biblical law in favour of humanistic law. It has begun to persecute Christian groups which will not submit to regulations and controls. For Christian agencies to place Christ's realm under the state is tantamount to denying the lordship of Jesus Christ and abandoning the faith. Law is the word and will of a sovereign. As we have noted, the first edition of the Encyclopedia Britannica, 1771, defined law as the command of the sovereign power containing a common rule of life for the subjects. Scripture recognises no human agency as a sovereign power. God is at war against all such claims. Both church and state are ministries under God, and the state and its rulers are literally a diaconate. Romans chapter 13, verses 1 to 4. Servants of the Lord. A state thus has no independent powers, only powers, or more literally, a service delegated to it by the triune God. Laws thus express the will of the sovereign Lord of a social order, and, as such, they express the working religion of the state and its people. If the states or the people have differing religions, there will be conflict between the two, because each then has a different concept of government. Government like law, is a theological concept. It is revelatory of the God of a system or a society. Among other things, God is government, as well as love, justice, mercy, redemption and more. There can be no salvation if God is not also the absolute government over all things. How else can God redeem us if he does not absolutely govern all things? Apart from God's sovereign and predestining power, our salvation would at best be conditional. There would be a collapse and a forfeiture of our salvation whenever things passed out of God's control. Where man and society are concerned, God's total government and predestination works to sanctify man and society by working from within transforming the regenerated man and his world through the Holy Spirit. Where non-biblical faith seeks to gain control, the result is totalitarianism. The alternative to government by God's law and spirit working through the inner man is the totalitarian state. One consequence of the humanistic alternative is a bureaucracy. In 1944, Ludwig von Mises called attention to the fact that most critics of bureaucracy were attacking a symptom, not a cause. He wrote of its totalitarian implications. Totalitarianism is much more than mere bureaucracy. It is the subordination of every individual's whole life, work and leisure to the orders of those in power and office. 
It is the reduction of man to a cog in an all-embracing machine of compulsion and coercion. It forces the individual to renounce any activity of which the government does not approve. It tolerates no expression of dissent. It is the transformation of society into a strictly disciplined labour army, as the advocates of socialism say, or into a penitentiary, as its opponents say. The philosophy of bureaucratism leads to a condition wherein the state is always right and the individual is always wrong. Because the people are always wrong, they must be changed by means of totalitarian controls. German Marxians coined the dictum, If socialism is against human nature, then human nature must be changed. They did not realise that if man's nature is changed, he ceases to be a man. The logic of bureaucratism and controls leads to the kind of thinking expressed by Professor Joan Robinson of Cambridge University. Second only to Lord Keynes himself in the leadership of the Keynesian school. Mrs. Robinson is not only afraid of independent churches, universities, learned societies and publishing houses, but no less of independent theatres and philharmonic societies. All such institutions, she contends, should be allowed to exist only, provided the regime is sufficiently secure to risk criticism. And another distinguished advocate of British collectivism, J.C. Crowther, does not shrink from praising the blessings of Inquisition. What a pity the Stuarts did not live to witness the triumph of their principles. In every religion we see implicitly what is explicit in biblical faith. Man is made in the image of his God. Genesis chapter 1 verses 26 to 28. The modern state is dedicated to the belief that man can, by actions of state, that is coercion, be made a new creation dwelling in a state-created paradise. Man being a sinner, violence and coercion have been endemic in all history, but never more extensively, intensively or systematically than now. Because modern man's vision of life and its promises is statist, and a state is organised coercion, man sees violence and coercion as the means to self-realisation. Society is seen as governed by the conflict of interests. It is a war of the haves and have-nots, a war between the generations, between capital, labour and agriculture, and so on and on. In a healthy society, when men say, I want, they mean, I work. In a status society, I want is followed by, we expropriate. The role model given to students in the status schools is derived from its religious ontology, that is, from evolution, which means that man is reduced to a naked ape. For an ape, possession requires strength and force, and we have, in the latter half of the 20th century, an unequal lawlessness and violence on the part of precisely those youth who would normally be entering the workforce and preparing for marriage. The key to the good society in humanistic society is acts of state, not the work of the Christian man. The future is seen as depending on what the state does rather than on what free men do. Moreover, the governing word in society is not thus saith the Lord God, but thus saith Congress. The result is the triumph of externalism and salvation by works, a triumph of state which is disaster for all men. The status plan of salvation is in effect the plan of salvation by bureaucracy, since the bureaucracy as the state apparatus for implementing its plan of salvation, is the working saviour of a state. Whether it's a war against poverty, disease, crime or anything else, the bureaucracy is the arm of society whereby this saving statist power is to be exercised. 
The consequences of this action have been described by Huntley. Italians complain about five-year waits for tax refunds. Germans about the tomaten shoots for Erdnung, a law forbidding them to squeeze tomatoes in markets, and Indians about bribes demanded by school offices. A service that takes days at most in the West can take years in Indonesia, where an electric power or phone connection to a newly built house may not be installed for three or four years. Solution Bribe government workers to plug into a neighbour's line. Burma requires six copies of a visa request, including the applicant's life history and no carbons, please. Sometimes bribery deals in human life. In communist Vietnam, corrupt officials accept money to let refugees escape by boat. Those who lack money don't leave and may wind up in jail. Bribery also frees the sons of the affluent from military service. An Indian these days must slip money to an official on the side to enrol a child in school, to gain admittance to a hospital, even to secure reservations on a train. Bribery is so pervasive that many businesses routinely assign an employee to do nothing else but pay off various government officials. In West Germany, the reach of the bureaucrat extends into virtually every nook and cranny of private life. Besides the no tomato squeezing ordinance, Germans have to put up with rules that limit late-night parties, one per dwelling per month, and details where and when to hang laundry, away from the streets and never on Sunday. For 200 years, we thought that we could regulate life through more and more regulations and controls, said Herbert Hemlich, a member of Parliament who founded an anti-red tape society. Now we have to change this. All bureaucracies pale beside those of the Soviet Union and China. God, as sovereign or lord, allows only ministries to function under him, and very limited ones at that. Civil government is severely limited because, in biblical law, its taxing power is limited to a head or poll tax, a half shekel for every man aged 20 or over per year, neither more nor less. Exodus chapter 30, verses 11 to 16. The church is also limited because the tithe, God's tax, is to the Lord, not to the sanctuary. One tenth of the tithe went directly to the priests. Numbers chapter 18, verses 25 and 26. But since the musicians also were provided for by the tithe, perhaps a little more, the rest went to the work of the Levites, which included instruction, Deuteronomy chapter 33, verse 10, and much more. Thus, neither church nor state have any valid biblical grounds for a position of centrality in society. God, through his law, speaks to every man. With the coming of Christ and the new creation, beginning with his resurrection and continuing in our regeneration, the law is now written in our hearts. Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 31 to 34. Every man in Christ must be a walking law and an evidence of the presence of the Holy Spirit. God's government of the world begins with the self-government of the Christian man. God's basic social institution is the family, to which God's law entrusts all the basic powers in government except the death penalty, which is reserved to the state. The control of children, of property, of inheritance, of education and of welfare belong to the family. The basic functions of government are personal and familial responsibilities under God. Moreover, if men will neither tithe nor be responsible, it is because they are slaves and wish to be governed rather than to govern. Free men in Christ are working members of the kingdom of God. They have been remade in Christ into the image of God, into knowledge, righteousness, holiness and dominion. 
Genesis chapter 1 verses 26 to 28, Colossians chapter 3 verse 10, Ephesians 4 verse 24, Romans chapter 2, 14 and 15. With God's law written in their hearts and power to fulfill it, as a Westminster larger catechism, answer 17 declares, Tragically, almost none of those who profess adherence to the Westminster standards are ready to call attention today to this phrase concerning the redeemed man and God's law, power to fulfil it. Redemption is the restoration of that power. All law defines good and evil. It prescribes what is believed to be evil and protects what is good. Laws against murder protect life and condemn whatever is anti-life and anti-moral. B. Malinowski in A Family Among Australian Aborigines, 1913, observed All social organisation implies a series of norms which extend over the whole social life and regulate, more or less strictly, all the social relations. This is a scientifically sanitised way of saying that all laws set forth a religious and moral standard to govern all of society. Punishment expresses the reprobation of a society. For Christians, God ordains a reprobation. According to an old proverb, a change of laws is a change of lords. New lords, new laws. Legal revolutions are first of all religious revolutions. As men abandon one faith for another, they abandon one morality for another also, and, as a result, their sense of justice changes. Things once tolerable become intolerable, and evils once a source of horror become everyday occurrences. The history of the past is rewritten by each new faith in terms of its legal, moral premises. The age of faith becomes the dark ages and the dark world of Roman imperial totalitarianism becomes a golden age. Thus, for Edward Gibbon, the decline and fall of the Roman Empire replaced the life of Christ as the pivotal events in history. In his first paragraph he wrote, In the second century of the Christian era, the Empire of Rome comprehended the fairest part of the earth and the most civilised portion of mankind. The frontiers of that extensive monarchy were guarded by ancient renown and disciplined valour. The gentle but powerful influences of laws and manners had gradually cemented the union of the provinces. Their peaceful inhabitants enjoyed and abused the advantages of wealth and luxury. The image of a free constitution was preserved with decent reverence, the Roman senates appeared to possess the sovereign authority and devolved on the emperor all the executive powers of government. During a happy period, AD 98 to 180, of more than fourscore years, the public administration was conducted by the virtue and abilities of Nerva, Trajan, Hadrian and the two Antonines. It is the design of this and of the two succeeding chapters to describe the prosperous condition of their empire and afterwards, from the death of Marcus Antonius, to deduce the most important circumstances of its decline and fall, a revolution which will ever be remembered and is still felt by the nations of the earth. This is a thorough and devout affirmation of an aspect of humanism of an Enlightenment version thereof. Gibbon, who despised the lives of the saints, gave us his own form of hagiography, careful in his details, while false in his perspective and picture. The world of Gibbon and his contemporaries has given us a different religion and law than does scripture, because the men of the Enlightenment, of Romanticism and the Age of Revolutions, and of modern humanism, have had another sovereign than the Lord God. Their sovereign is the state and its philosopher kings, its elite planners. As a result, they have consistently, faithfully and systematically given us another law than biblical law. 
this should not surprise us. It's logical, and it means faithfulness to their doctrines. The disastrous fact is the inconsistency, unfaithfulness, and illogical stance of those who profess Christ 